Welcome to Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. My name is Andrew Murata, host of the show, and it is show number 55. Oh, sorry, Chris, you're still on it. There we go. Uh, it is show number 55, and uh, we are getting started here. Happy to be back on the air, and uh, welcome to all of our audience listening live on Facebook and to all of our friends on iTunes or wherever you are listening. I see Tom Fagione, a friend of the program, on there. Tom, thanks for being here and joining us. So we're excited to uh, be on today. It is the last day of July, and uh, unbelievably, August is creeping upon us. Uh, and we are talking about reading today. The topic today is going to uh, be about reading. And uh, before we get to our topic, I do want to uh, thank our sponsor for today's show, I've mentioned her before. She's a friend of the program. This is uh, Michelle DiFilippo and her company, uh, 1106 Design. Uh, Michelle and I have become friends over the past year, and she has helped me uh, design my book and, and helped everything soup to nuts. Uh, we're going to meet an author today. Chris Kreuter is going to be with us shortly, and uh, we're going to talk about his journey, about how he wrote his book. But Michelle DiFilippo at her company, 1106 Design, uh, was a great help. And so if you're thinking about writing a book, you, you, you've you written a book, maybe you want some help with it, um, wherever you are in your journey of writing a book, certainly it is worth a phone call to Michelle. She will get back to you. Mention that you uh, heard about 1106 Design uh, on the program, and, and she will help you out. They do everything from editing to book formatting to uh, your, your the book binding, the type of book, all of those things. Uh, and she was great to work with. So uh, I do thank her for sponsoring the show. You can reach out to her uh, at 1106design and uh, she will take care of you. So mention the program, Education, Leadership and Beyond, and she will definitely help you out. So uh, again, thank you to her for sponsoring the show. But as I mentioned, we are going to talk about reading today uh, because we do have a, a a great young author on and uh, a friend of the program, Chris Kreuter. Um, but in the summertime, right, all those kids out there, the school kids, they talk about slippage where maybe they aren't reading as much. They're certainly not doing as much schoolwork. Um, but I'm going to talk about the eight reasons why reading is so important. And uh, this is from J.J. Wong and InspirationBoost.com. The eight reasons why reading is so important. And uh, but in my conversations with parents, right, I'm going to meet a whole new crop of parents coming up uh, with this new freshman class in September. And uh, even the elementary parents, they like to share where their kids are and their reading levels, certainly when they're above reading level. Uh, but that's a real important thing. And how do you do well in your reading level? You read. You read to your kids. You get, uh, uh, you know kids to read, you, you, you know, all things reading, right? And uh, if you're a parent out there, we're going to meet Chris here in a minute. He's going to be a brand new parent any minute, any day here. Um, but the importance of reading to your child and having your child read. So that is something that my family and I, very important uh, to us to have our kids reading uh, to be successful in school. So but whether it's an adult, whether it's a kid, whether it's you, um, the eight reasons why reading is important, again, from J.J. Wong and inspirationboost.com. Number one, exposing yourself to new things, right? You walk into a library. You walk into someone's home. Chris is going to talk about that. You see the books that are on there. Um, I grew up in Staten Island. We, we experienced 9-11 uh, up front and close uh, and personal. Uh, a friend of mine just gave me uh, Rudy Giuliani's book on leadership. and. Um, you know, the uh, uh, all the things that, that Rudy Giuliani can offer there. So number one, exposing yourself to new things. Number two, self-improvement. I love that section of the uh, 
uh, of the bookstore and, and, and all those things about building self-confidence, taking action, uh, anything that you can make yourself better with, those tools are out there um, and, and books on self-improvement. With my lifestyle and those that know me and the, and the traveling I do and uh, the busy schedule I keep, I do like to listen to, to books on uh, Amazon.com. And I am currently listening to The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Blankety Blank. I'm not going to use the F word on air, but that's one of the books I am uh, uh, listening to right now. The Subtle Art of Not Giving a Blank. And uh, again, self-improvement, right? Trying to get better. Number three, improve understanding. There's so much that we can learn. And uh, certainly with these devices, right? These cell phones out there, uh, I've decided to keep mine downstairs uh, in the evening. Uh, so I do, when I do go upstairs, I am reading. And, uh, uh, but there's so much to learn and, and understand. I love reading with my kids. They love the nature books right now and, and books about animals. And I'm reading those with them and uh, so much to learn out there, right? Number four, preparation to action. You can learn about how to do something, how to get ready for something, right? All those people that have come before us uh, that have done something. So you read, you learn, you do, you achieve. Uh, and you can do that by reading. Uh, I'm a good friend of the program, Nancy Dunn, the nurse at my school, uh, she gave me a book, RV Trips for Dummies. And uh, we took our second RV trip coming up here. And uh, I learned uh, a lot from that book. And uh, certainly thank Nancy for giving that to me. And uh, But I was preparing to take action and be in that RV trip. Number five, gaining experience from other people. My good friend, Dr. Rob Gilbert, who gave an amazing shout out today on the hotline. Uh, if you don't call the hotline, if you're listening, you got a pen. If you're Corey Ferguson uh, listening in the car on Facebook, 973-743-4690. Jot that down, 973-743-4690. That's my friend, Dr. Rob Gilbert. Gave me an amazing shout out on the program today. Um, but he always said, success leaves clues, right? So who better to learn from that people have been successful? And there's people out there that I admire and I look uh, look up to. And um, I love reading biographies or autobiographies, right, that are telling stories about people. Uh, in this article here, inspirationboost.com, the eight reasons of why reading is so important uh, by J.J. Wong. He wrote, there are 4,000 billionaires and 12 million millionaires. You know, the first thing that these people do is read to learn about where others uh, get their success from. So uh, gaining experience from other people. Tools of communicating. Number six, tools of communicating. When you have information, when you have a background in uh, an area, if you learn something from a book, uh, using that information is a great tool for communication. Uh, I love the Malcolm Gladwell books. I've talked about them often on the program. I'm going to try to get Malcolm Gladwell on the program. Um, but I've learned a lot in there about communicating. One of the things I've learned, the broken window theory, right? He talks about that in, in, in his books. And uh, I've implemented that in my school. And I've spoken about it a lot at meetings where I want to take care of the school and make the school look beautiful. And that's the reason why. Learned it in a book. Number seven, connecting your brain. When you are reading a book, you are activating your brain. You are getting things moving. Um, you are connecting your brain to information. And number eight, boosting, boosting imagination and creativity, right? Uh, we're going to meet today Chris Kreuter, uh, and we're going to talk about his book, The Intergalactic Adventures of the Rainy River Bees. We're going to meet Chris in a minute. But you want to talk about creativity. Uh, there was so much going on in this book about kids and hockey and outer space and aliens. Uh, my 10-year-old son, Matthew, read it and fell in love with it. And I can't wait to ask uh, Chris about this and where did he get the idea. And, and uh, But it's certainly I saw that happening in my son's mind and in my son's life and tucking him in at night, you know, asking questions about, Dad, can you really get beamed to another planet? And 
can that happen? And, and got all kind of thinking about that kind of stuff. So um, we're going to ask uh, Chris about that when we meet him up here in a minute. So again, if you're a parent, if you're listening, uh, if you are one of the young listeners, one of my students listening, the eight reasons why reading is important. We'll go over them real quick again. Exposing yourself to new things. Self-improvement, number two. Number three, improve understanding. Number, number four, preparation to action. Number five, gain experience from other people. Number six, tools for communicating. Number seven, connecting your brain. And number eight, boost imagination and creativity. Even though it's summertime, we're talking about reading because uh, we are going to meet an author coming up here uh, in just a minute, Chris Croyder. And before we meet Chris, one more shout out again to today's sponsor, uh, Design 1106. This is a copy of Michelle's book, Publish Like the Pros. And uh, if you're thinking about writing a book, if it's in the, in your mind, and after you hear Chris, uh, I think you, you might want to get going on that book. Um, but Michelle was a great help, and uh, she will send you a free copy of this book, Publish Like the Pros. Again, 1106 Design. You can check her out online at design 1106design.com and reach out to her and let her know you heard her on the program. Let's get started, everyone. We're going to meet our guest. Here he is, Chris Croyder. Welcome to the program. Hey, thanks for hey, having thanks me. Thanks for having me. I'm going to be, on. Going to be on. Yeah, Chris, I know you've been listening, and uh, I'm glad I got your pronunciation down. I was going to say Cruder, okay. but you uh, corrected me in our pre-show uh, there. It's Croyder. Yeah, Bavarian. Yeah, Bavarian uh, tricky with the tricky with the <laughs> Well, so were the, some of the names uh, with your characters in your book here. And uh, Chris, I really appreciate you coming on the program, and uh, I'm excited to talk to you about, you know, this sci-fi kind of middle school kid book like tell me about this book and i know it's your first book we're going to talk about your second book but where the heck did this idea and this title come from for your first book <laughs> well it's a good story i mean the, the the second book that we'll talk about later is actually the first book that i wrote um and we'll talk a little bit about feedback cycles on books they're kind of long to write i, I had a few probably two or three months spam where i know it's been waiting to get beta feedback but you got to keep writing. You know, it's one of those disciplines where you got to go try to make it a daily practice or as best as you can. So I wanted to keep writing. And I'm like, all right, well, I, I don't want to be writing a whole nother in-depth novel that has lots of cat plot and characters um, that, that's very deep. Because the, the book we'll talk about, the shortcut, is, was very exhausting to write. So I wanted something kind of light and fun. I really always wanted to write a book for kids. I'm like, all right, let me, let me draft a, a kid's book. All right. I always want to write the books that I like to. I would have loved to read as a kid. So I loved hockey. I love science fiction. So mashup time. You know, if you look at the sports books that are out there, a lot of them are very realistic. You know, a lot of them don't you know, won't have these, these something like science fiction layered on top of it. You know, Space Jam and and it's kind of like Space Jam meets the Mighty Ducks. That was the original inspiration. Okay. So I just started writing, and you know, it's it's funny because the first draft, I, it just poured out of me, and. I just can see them see in my pants, I guess. Yeah. You know, Chris, I had uh, lucky enough to have John Feinstein on, uh, you know, famous sports writer. Yeah. And that's what he said. I asked him about writing. He said, write about things that you know about and write about things that you love. And you just mentioned these two loves of sci-fi and, and hockey. Tell me about those. Uh, were those things that you uh, fell in love with when you were a kid? Yeah, I mean, nine-year-old Chris Kreider would have gone nuts for this book, right? Now, that's really, I wrote it for him. Ten-year-old Matthew Murata did, I'll tell you that. <laughs> I'm getting great reactions from kids. You know, I'll go to a tournament and it's like, oh, I read your book, I love it. And that, that's that's why I do it. It's not, you know, we don't we don't write books for the money. You know that all too well. <laughs> it's about getting we're, working on that. We're, working, <laughs> we're working on that. We'll talk about marketing, but, you know, a lot of it's just about, you know, getting your voice out there in the world and influencing, inspiring other people. And having a kid come up and say that just means the world to me. So I wrote it definitely for, for him. And it's all about kind of finding your place in the universe and, and navigating a lot of things, you know, for, especially in hockey. And you know, I grew up, you know, not really affording to be able to play on a, on travel teams and things like that, but I still got the chance to be on the ice, play street hockey with my brothers. And for me, it's kind of a love letter to hockey. You know, the, the game has given me so much, you know, even today I look at the you know teams I play on, my financial planner, my accountant, uh, I got, you know, guys, that. I, do my HVAC, electric, you know, all, the, all these connections that you make and beyond this, the, the, the dollars and cents of it, but just the friendships that I've gained over the years. 
Um, moving, you know, I've moved, had two major moves in my life and, and hockey's given me an instant network of friends and, and acquaintances and people that have just grown, grown to love in a lot of ways. So this is kind of a way for me to give back to the game. Um, cool. And science fiction for me has been a passion ever since I was a kid. You know, I grew up with Star Trek and to a certain extent Star Wars and all these different um, books and movies. You know, my mom encouraged me to just whatever my passion went to, to go in that direction. And actually for me, there was a show in the mid 90s called Sequest DSV. You know, uh, Rob Schneider, the guy from Jaws was the main okay. character and only only had only had three seasons, but. It really inspired me a lot. You know, I loved the I loved the ocean, loved underwater, and actually inspired me to become an ocean engineer. And that's how I ended up. As, I work on trains now, but you know, I went to school for what what inspired me as a kid. Wow, well, that's Chris. Let me jump to that next question. I, you know, we started talking books right away, but tell me a little bit about your story, uh, your title. I, I ran out of room here with so many of the things that you're doing, artist and engineer and. Uh, you're going to be a dad, but tell us a little bit about your background and, and your story. Uh, you you know, you're working on trains now, but tell us that story. Yeah. So I went to school for ocean engineering at the University of Rhode Island. I uh, fell in love with it. You know, it's kind of early decisions. There was only five schools in the country that offered it back in the day. Wow. Um, you know, I did a lot of work with autonomous underwater vehicles, mechanical, en electrical engineering. Um, but I moved to New York pretty suddenly um, after college, uh, say a year after I graduated. Um I did, had to find a job and living in New York City is not the cheapest uh, thing. So uh, ironically enough, I ended up back uh, working for a company called Kawasaki out of Yonkers, which is about three blocks from where I was born. <laughs> I'm a New Yorker, born and raised. Okay. Uh, so yeah, just- the Kawasaki like the motorcycles, Kawasaki? No, like the rail cars. So we were both oh, okay. in New York City Transit and, and just started making a career and, and fell in love with it really quickly. But because I had this degree, it was kind of a jack of all trades, master of none. And I got to work with some really great people. And, my skills were very applicable because I had this flexible mentality. I was just open to change. And so now it's 14 years later and I'm still, I've been bouncing around the rail industry and, and got built a great career out of it. Very cool. Chris, you know, you are doing a lot of different things and uh, you know, you're an artist and, and if you look up at Chris uh, you could see his stuff there. How do you balance all this, all this stuff that you're doing and you have a baby on, we might be cutting the short uh, show short here. You agreed to do the show here and thank you. But how do you balance your time writing books, being an engineer, playing hockey? You know, I consider myself a busy guy, but you're, you're right up there. Yeah. I mean, partially it's about sacrifices. You know, there's going to be certain, especially with a baby on the way, there's going to be certain things where you can't be playing on two or three hockey teams every week. You know, you maybe cut that down to once a week when, as life calls for it. Um, but it's all about being organized. You've got to have your plan. If you if you kind of just go by the seat of my pants, you know, I'd just be, you know, right in here or just kind of go where my go where my follow my passion, which is on a macro level is fine, but on a day to day basis, if you, if you let your whims dictate what you do, you kind of do a little bit of everything, but you don't actually deliver on things. So if I know I want to get this, I'm writing the sequel for Rainy River Bees, for example, knowing okay, here's my plot. I want to try to write a chapter every single day or every other day now because I've been a little bit busy, but you know, come up with that schedule and that plan and say, if I'm going to write, I'm not going to just like whatever I think about writing that day. It's going to be follow the plan for the book. And that's how you get books out there in the world. Um, and you go through that editing process. If I'm going to be doing something at work, you know, I have a lot of different clients and projects. What's the priority? Set, setting my schedule the night before. Say, okay, this is what I'm going to accomplish tomorrow. You have to still you know, make your day-to-day -day changes. Life, life happens, but um, I kind of go out there with some, some semblance of structure because I'm an engineer. You got to have some structure, right? Um, so it's, it's, yeah, I get, I do a lot of things, but I'm not doing them all at the same time. You know, some things like the board game design, I've owned a board game publishing company and we, we can talk about that later, but you know, that was, I'm, I'm not really active right now. There was a time and a place for that. And right now in my life, I'm really about the writing and the book promotion. And as your situation in life changes, you get kids, they want to start playing games again. I'm going to get that bug, that itch. and I can go back and explore that and build on, upon the skills that I've already developed. So, Chris, I, I want you. We're leading into these questions. It's great, but I wanted to ask you, like, how do you write? Um, I wrote my book, uh, uh, The Principal, when I, you know, I was on the road uh, a lot with my officiating, and I knew when I would have time on the plane or the train, or um, I, I carved out that time. But I find it very challenging now. You got your second book coming out, making the time. I'm doing the podcast and this, you know. 
and I just wrote maybe a tip or two at a time. But do you write a chapter at a time? Do you just keep writing? I'm going to write for two hours. What is your style, and and how did you go about doing that? Uh, I'll say my style has been a little sporadic lately. Obviously, uh, starting a nursery and prepping for a baby has has, has taken a, a hit. But for me, it's um, I write very strong outlines. So for the Rainy River Bees, it was very much like I knew what the plot was. I knew where my I knew where my um, my beats were in the story. So I, I knew for, for kids' books, we really want to go with short, impactful chapters. Get in, tell your story, get out, move to the next yeah. chapter. So that, those tend to be anywhere from 1,000 to 2,000 words, more on the lower end of that scale. And that's, that's, that's a writing session or even two chapters in a session. Um, over the weekend, I, I was able to get a chapter and a half done because I was really in the groove and I'll keep going. But you know, writing is also tough because you have to have that kind of creative mindset. If you have a lot of distraction or things going on in your life or a lot of demands in your time, it's harder to be creative. Um, with a book like The Shortcut, which is more very, very thick, um, involved a lot more revising and editing, you know, that that was more of a word count basis. So for me, I'll say, all right, I want to get at least 2,000 words a day. Kind of when I, when I sit down to write, whether, whatever book it is, it's just easier to bite that off when you're talking about a full chapter. I feel like a really, like, boom, chapter 38 is done, 39 is tomorrow. You get that kind of repetitive thing, whereas a book that only has 15 or 20 chapters is a lot harder to, to build, build that momentum. I was surprised to hear Feinstein say, I asked him the same question, and he said he always ends in the middle of a sentence. That way, when he picks it up the next day, he's just continued that sentence, and, and then off he goes again. Sorry, and I found... Guys, I can do that. <laughs> yeah, right? He just jumped right in. Um, Chris, in addition to the book, in addition to work, you mentioned about you know, you're becoming a father here any moment. Uh, what does that mean to you? It means a lot. I mean, you know, we've uh, look, looking forward to this for a long time. You know, I'll be 36 in a couple of weeks here. And and for me, you know, I was kind of thought the plan was this would happen earlier. And I've been able to accomplish a lot with that extra time. But now it's it's all about spending time with this new person in my life, this new love in our lives and making that commitment. You know, I want to be home. I want to be reading bedtime stories. I want to be, you know, getting them excited to learn things and develop skills. You know, those eight, those eight things, those eight reasons you gave from J.J. Wong are, are great examples of just being able to to give of myself and and share all these all these things with her, it's going to be fantastic. It's it's a girl. Yeah. Oh yeah. We're happy. Oh man. Girl. You got a little hockey out, outfit for her yet? <laughs> we, we, we got a little, a little St. Louis Blues uniform. Uh, <laughs> for so again, we don't we're not going to force it on her. But my wife's actually a great figure skater, so she'll she'll get on skates regardless. So very cool. Okay. Uh, Chris, uh, being a father is very important to me. I think it's a, a leadership. So we do talk a lot about fathers on here. I've had Larry Hagner on, uh, who runs the Dad's Edge, which is a great podcast. Um, and I'm considering joining his mastermind group. But what is something that, you know, as a father, I want to blank for Chris Croydon? For me, it's very much about not being too overbearing. Uh, I think a lot of it's kind of maybe a symptom of of our world today but i think a lot of people conflate their child's accomplishments or desires with their own i think there's very much a, a need to let her have her space you know my parents kind of let me explore what i wanted to explore and supported me and gave me the opportunities as best as they could to explore that whether it had been hockey or if i really wanted to play basketball they would have driven me to practice or, or did the things that, that i would have needed to do but what that does is it gives a child the freedom uh, to be self-sufficient to be confident to to go out there and be flexible because now if I look back on my life now, my parents gave me that freedom to make my own mistakes too. You know, not, not being, I want you to do this. I, I expect you to do this. And, and and that really helped me to figure things out at a younger age. So for me, that's really what I want to be as a father as well. Well, uh, here on education leadership and beyond, we're wishing you the best. And uh, yeah, it's you. exciting to see someone who's successful in their life, you know, adding a baby there. And uh, I wish you good health. Thanks. Yeah. Chris, in that, you're right, you have this daughter coming now, and, and I like that you use the word, you know, side hustle, right? You got this project going on, the the, the other, uh, the board game company and that kind of stuff. Um, tell me about that and, and, and your energy, right? You're writing, you're doing things. Tell me about um, that balance and, and you having the energy to continue to do these things. I think for me, I've always wanted that creative outlet. You know, even from kindergarten, my mom still stores a couple of these old books where they let you, you know, they type something up on a typewriter. Um, the younger part of your audience might not know what that is, but before computers, you know, they type up these little stories and, and these, like, they put, um, 
put wallpaper around it, like just like a little mini book and you draw the pictures of what your stories were. And I just love doing that kind of stuff as a kid. So I've always been, whether it be drawing, I've, I've published an abstract comic books, you know, 10, 12 years ago, uh, web comics I've, I've dabbled in just telling stories, being creative has, has always been important, you know, for a, for a good chunk of time, I poured that energy into board games, um, which was really funny because the, all the while you're learning skills, right? Um, forming masquerade games with my college buddy, Chris Gosselin, I got the opportunity, you know, we had this game we wanted, we wanted to get out there in the world and we wanted to publish it, but the, you know, an abstract game like chess or checkers, something that doesn't have an inherent theme, what, what theme do you put on it? So we tried all these different, we had it like hamsters and balls. We had just boring, just like chess like pieces. We went with this Babylonian theme, but what happened is I learned how to use Photoshop and Illustrator, all these Adobe products. It was basically, I did 18 different designs and oh wow, I know how to use Photoshop now. And that job skill is translated into doing all the graphic design for Rainy River Bees, stuff at work and my day job, um, publishing a game, doing a warehouse of shipping, um, help me in the sales role. I do a lot of uh, sales in the rail industry. So you're learning all these cool skills that actually can be applied to other areas of your life. And what was cool with the, with the writing, the writing process involves a lot of um, very tough reflection on your own writing. And so with board game design, I already learned, I, I had this built-in skill where you, you'd, this is the best game ever. It's, it's going to work. It's going to be great. You're building a system. You're building this, this piece of art in a way that, you know, you think it's going to work perfectly, or, or you may think it has some flaws, but people are going to think this is awesome. And, and you put it on the table and, and then people review it and like, eh, no, it doesn't work. And being comfortable with that feedback and that process of iterating um, over and over and honing the design, finding the fun, as, as they like, a lot of people call it really prepares you well for writing because you're, you're comfortable to my, the first draft of the shortcut, the first book that I wrote, which I started 10 years ago, I, I wrote it and, I, and I'll tell you the story later about, about how I came to this, but I got some feedback. I'm like, oh, yeah, maybe eight chapters setting up the love story is not relevant. It's not the right way to start the story because it's not the heart of it. And so, well, let me get lead. on that. So, did you have someone read it in, in the kind of halfway through or in the beginning? Yeah, so it was funny because of board games. Um, I was I was part of the New York City board game designers group. You know, we were a publisher at the time. We were really active. Um, I got to meet a great group of game designers, some of whom you know, have gone on to start their own companies. A lot of them have been published. I think there's something like 13 or 14 games that came out of that, published games that came out of that group already. Cool. Some great friendships. And, but I'm sitting, there's somebody that had a game that used the same board that our, our, our published game used. I'm like, dude, I got to try this. And I sit down. He's like, yeah, I just, I want to get in front of publishers. I'm like, well, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. I'd love to try to work with you on it. And so this guy, Carlos, and I sat down one day at a cafe in the city. And he goes, uh, we start talking and, and I'm, I'm doing something in Photoshop to show him. And we're just talking and having a conversation. He goes, I'm like, what do you do for a living? Oh, well, you know, I, I'm PhD in English. Like, oh, well, you know, I, what do you do with that? Well, I teach it. That's, I teach at the City University of New York. Oh, that's cool. What, what, what do you teach? Well, science fiction. I'm like, <laughs> really? So I just finished, the, I just finished yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm writing the first draft of a, of a sci-fi novel. I'd love to read. Oh, yeah, man. Because I'm helping him out with this board game. He's like, I'd love to, I'd love to read it. He comes back, gives me his feedback. Um, you know, you fast forward to 10 years later, the, the guy's one of my best friends. We've done collaborations on stuff. He's, 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 has a, uh, he's a published author. You know, he's got books coming out. Uh, there's a book coming out in February from, uh, or March from Disney. I mean, this guy has become a great mentor to me in my life, but also a very close friend, all because, this, you know, because of board games and has helped be my, you know, one of the biggest influences me in my writing career. And it's all because of that, just being in that creative environment and, and having that feedback cycle. So, so tell me like about that. that then. So you put then the shortcut on hold, which is kind of ironic that the shortcut took you all these years to write with the name <laughs> shortcut. Yeah, but, that's what my wife pointed out too. Yeah, tell us a little bit about that story, about that book, and uh, um, you know, what do you hope to to see from that book? I think for me, it was you know, I always dabbled with writing a, a full length novel, and I think that you know, the great American novel, and you, when you're in your early twenties, it sounds like a great idea. And, and now I, I had some had some time and some means and some perspective on the world. And, so I wrote the first draft. Obviously, I, I, I took this, you know, 50,000 words and realized that it really wasn't working and hit delete. Started writing. It. Yeah, uh, it was two, 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 years, two years of on and off writing. It was kind of a challenge myself to see if I can write that right to that length. And there was a heart there, but there was there was a lot wrong with it. Um, but again, board games made me comfortable with that process. And then I. Um, 
went through a few revisions, really started honing it. I, I sent it out to people and needed that break. And that's where I said, you know, let me write, let me write the Rainy River Bees. And that, that just took off and took out a life of its own. And so I kind of went back and forth a little bit as I was going through that cycle. So that's the one thing with writing as opposed to games, your, your feedback cycle is uh, a lot longer. Yeah. It's taking a while to read and, and to write and to edit. So. Well, that's cool. And, and uh, where can people find these books, Chris, where, where can they get them? And, uh, um, you know, what, what, you know, I mentioned your website. Can they get them from your website or Amazon? What's the best way to get them? So my website, chriscroyder.com, K-R-E-U-T-E-R. Um, that's got a links to all the, all the books themselves. Um, both books are available through lulu.com, which is a print-on-demand publisher. The Intergalactic Adventures of the Rainy River Bees, you can get on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You can order it from your local bookstore. Um, so it's through the whole distribution cycle. The shortcut will be there in probably six to eight weeks. I actually just got my my first batch of, of physical copies on Monday. So well, very cool. Really and I wanted to bring let's bring it back to the Rainy River Bees here. Um Chris again, my my son read this. Uh I had a chance to read it this week. And um, you know, tell me again, because the the design here, the colors, everything was really cool. As a uh, you know, a fiction book, the illustrations, how much of this helped tell the story and how much were you involved with the, the illustrations? So for me, um, knowing having published board games, um, knowing a lot about that industry and what makes a game sell off the shelf, this being from a person that you know, public, their first published game didn't really move off the shelf because it looked it wasn't in the right size box. It looked really boring. I realized that in order to sell a kid's book like this, the science fiction, you really need a cover that's going to pop. And, and you know, having having aliens that play hockey and a, 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 di a diamond-shaped rink as opposed to a regular rink, I wanted to kind of reflect some of the changes, things that I'm playing with. So if you look here, like the, you know, you've got the, the net in the middle. is not, not a rectangular net, but it's actually half of a hexagon. Uh huh. And there's a little triangle in the middle, the ultra goal, where you can score three points. You know, well, I think you're a basketball guy, so that's kind of up your alley, right? So, um, things like that, I wanted to reflect on the cover to say, this isn't your normal hockey book, but I still have the hockey sticks prominent. So I knew what I wanted in the, out of a cover, but, you know, yes, I can draw. I can't draw as good as Jack Para. And I had a good relationship with Jack through the board games. He had done some work for, for a game that we ended up not releasing, but. Uh, you know, put on Kickstarter and, and things like that. So I had a good relationship with Jack already, and I knew he'd knock it out of the park. Um, he's a, he's an artist based in New Jersey. I think his, his website is jackpowerartist.com. And, and I talked to Jack, and I'm like, I love these material illustrations, and, and, some, and the cover has got to pop. And he just knocked it out of the park because he knew I respected his process. Chris, how about, you know, who who is to say about how many uh... – uh, illustrations were on here because you know as kids right they want to be entertained and if they're reading about uh ref bot you know they want to see a, a picture of them yeah, how so, did you, how did you balance between making it almost a comic book versus you know how do you how do you do that uh, how much budget i had <laughs> okay um, did, I mean, so did it come down to the money yeah uh, for me at the time yeah um for me i it's so having self-published the book i said okay this is the amount of money i, I set aside for doing the art on the book the bulk of that's the cover because it's full color. I needed to have it so it's scaled down properly on the cover. Black yeah. and white interiors are a little bit more cost effective. But I knew that wasn't going to be enough for a kid's book. So having a graphic design background, um, my that those those things I can do. So on the back of the cover, you're going to see all the different logos for the different alien species that are in the game. So I did all the graphic design for those logos, but I had Jack do the B because I wanted to have more of a hand-drawn quality to it. Um, I also knew that I was being like, blowing it up on like promotional jerseys and stuff, you know, like this, where I had the logo <laughs> nice and big. So, you know, there's certain things that I was going to, I definitely wanted to pay money for to, to have done, but inside the book, there are things like there's a big puzzle they got to solve. So, you know, doing the layout and what that looks like. Uh, I have an example of one of the alien languages, which is all triangles and circles and stuff. I did all that. Um, there's a glossary in the back of the book that shows pictures of like what the intergalactic rink looks like, the dimensions. Those are things that I were all within my wheelhouse. So I added lots of additional content in there for that, just that reason, keeping the kids engaged and flowing through the story. And actually one of the coolest things uh, that I did, I, I think, is I uh, put scoreboards in there. So all throughout, instead of just saying what the score is, yeah. there's a scoreboard showing the different logos, what time it is on the clock, um, really add that hockey element to 
to the story. You start the book just like that. Yep, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, I would certainly recommend it to, um, you know, the librarians, whether it's high school. I mean, the book can be high school. The book could be middle school, even reach down to the younger levels. Um, but congratulations on that. And uh, uh, we're happy to talk about that on the show today. Yeah, it's definitely uh, just to touch on that, too. I mean, it says nine plus in the book. I've given a lot of great feedback from parents to seven or eight year olds. To, uh, you have to read the book, I think, at that level. Some of just to, just to handle some of the words and then, you know, you might depending on where they are. Reading level you talked about before, it's, it can be very sensitive to that on the lower end of that scale. But, you know, definitely nine and up. So for all you parents that are looking for something cool, if the, the dog days of summer, it's not hockey season yet, but uh, an entertaining book here. Uh, uh, again, for those kids that might be driving you crazy, tell them to go read for an hour, The Intergalactic Adventures of the Rainy River Bees. Um, Chris, we're up against the rapid fire portion of the show. Uh, this is favorite. my fan favorite. And, uh, uh, you know, just are you ready? Oh, yeah. Okay. I'm glad we got to it before the baby came. Here we go. So what is the, the last book that you read? So I'm going to cheat and to give you two. Um, like like you, I do a lot of traveling. I have a long commute. So I do an audio book as well as a physical book at any one time. So the last physical book I read was The Game Players of Titan by Philip K. Dick. And I try to read one of his books every year. Just a phenomenal uh, writer. And then audio books. I just read a series by this uh, Swedish man, uh, Frederick Backman, uh, Bear Town and Us Against You. Two of the best sports fiction books I've ever I've ever had the pleasure of. Say that, say that again. Bear Town, and Us Against You by Frederick Backman. Oh. Uh, they were translated into English. He, he's a pretty popular writer. A lot of his books have been translated to English. I hadn't heard of it. It's a hockey story in some small towns. It's all about small town sports, and everything is relying centered around the small town's troubles. But they they feed it all into this beloved love of this junior hockey team. But it, it's a dark book. It's not it's not a book for kids. But okay. Um, the audible version is just phenomenal. I just, as soon as the first book was done, I got the second one, just kept going. And, and cool. Phenomenal. Last movie you saw. So I actually, uh, I don't know. I don't watch a lot of movies, but I'm gonna, again, I'll cheat. And I'll go with TV. Um, my wife and I have been watching a lot of the comedians in cars getting coffee and Jerry Seinfeld's new project. Love the comedians in cars getting coffee. Yeah, you know, it's just, just hearing other people talk about their craft and their art and, and they're entertaining and funny as heck. So yeah. I want some to sort of that. That tied into the theme we talked about uh, the opening of the show here about the importance of reading, but learning from those other people. And uh, uh, I love comedians in cars getting coffee. And some of it's universal, but some of it's, you know, it's, some of it's particularly their craft and you just learn a lot. So thing, you know, the word is not afraid, Chris, but the thing that you have maybe anxiety about, you're nervous about being a parent. What is that, that thing most of? I think it's balancing family and career and, and the side hustles, you know, like we talked about a little bit before it's, I, I endeavor to be there for them and the importance of maximizing that time and reading to them and um, just being present and available to them, you know, not letting just, you know, I got to write the book. I'm sorry. I, I, I can't, I can't read to you if I, if I need to write. I think those are the kind of choices I definitely don't want to make, but so being able to balance that and still feel like I'm being, I'm achieving my own goals and my own dreams. That's especially early on. It's going to be a little bit tricky, but. It's a constant struggle. Yeah. <laughs> I've heard you hear stories Port, about it. And <laughs> we're here in the Port Jervis Library, uh, and, uh, you know, negotiating the time. You and I had to cancel one time. I wasn't able to do it. Um, but that is a constant struggle, but uh, an important one because you can't lose yourself 1,000% uh, in your kids because you got to take care of yourself as well. So that's a, that's a good answer, Chris. Uh, one of your biggest pet peeves. So, you know, we talk about being available. I think the biggest pet peeve I see right now is the dominance of cell phones. You know, these things are these things are great. I have the, the entire knowledge of the known universe in the palm of my hand, but knowledge isn't wisdom. And I see all too many people, you go to any restaurant, look around, you've got people with the cell phones on the table, they're looking at it. They're, you know, some parents aren't even talking at all uh, to each other or the, they got the iPad up. And so, the, you know, this is what you see of your kids. I know you can't, you know, it's not great radio, but you see like the hand in front of the face or the, or the big screen, the glows of the tables, it just, it, it really, everyone's got these digital pacifiers. So it really it makes me really sad to see that because we're losing that face-to-face, -face, the nonverbal communication and just being available to people. Yeah. I have a lot of pet peeves, but that one, that, that's the one that gets me, you know, really that's upset. A great, a great answer. And I know those iPhones cost more than a hundred bucks, but what's the last purchase under a hundred dollars that has had the greatest impact on your life? Yeah, I got one of these Fitbit Slims, the the ones that you, they're a little waterproof. They don't have the screen or anything. They just, 
and it's not for the reasons you think. I'm an active guy. I play hockey three to four times a week. Again, it'll be a lot less soon, so maybe I need yeah. maybe, do need to be more active and have walk around more. But you know, it's a silent alarm feature on this thing. So I get up at stupid o'clock, as I like to call it. Um, if you want to, if you want to get all this stuff done in your life, sometimes you know, sleep. You know, you don't want to sleep until six, seven o'clock. You know, like you, I'm up at you know five, five thirty in the morning to get all these things done, and and that can really upset your wife, especially when she's nine months pregnant. So this thing will buzz and, and be, my, be my alarm, and I'm up just because of this, and that's uh, definitely helping the marriage. <laughs> okay, letting your wife sleep is a, a very good thing, Chris. We you, we didn't really talk so much about leadership. Um, but in your opinion and all the things that you're doing, you know, what do you think are the most important qualities uh, of a leader? So for three, you know, for the three that I really, uh, the first one is passion. The second is learning. And the third is by example. So like by passion, I really mean, you know, it's, um, I'm passionate about railroading, you know, uh, what, what I do for a living, you know, I, I build it, you know, it's help build trains and sell systems. Um, right now I'm, I'm doing a lot of stuff on the sensor side that makes trains safer to operate railroads, safer to operate or, or more efficient. Um, if you don't come from a place of passion about what you're doing, then there's no way for you to lead other people. Um, I think it's really sent a, a core element to anything that you're doing, whether it be hockey, you know, being in the locker room, you know, being serious about it or, or really doing everything you can to help the team or whether it be professionally. The second, you know, learning, it's, it's always striving to learn more. I, I want to, do more in my day-to-day job, it get better, whether it be listening to a podcast and negotiation or um, knowing more about the products or the, the who I'm selling to. And third, you know, the lead by example, it's it, lead by example, but also stay vocal, you know, communicate. So you, you share that passion, share those skills, help develop the team around you to be even more effective. Great. Best thing about being a writer. Uh, there's limitless possibilities, you know, for me, I can let my imagination run wild. You know, my friend Carlos, I mentioned before, he gave me this, this, this thing, I mean, writing is my best thought and it's stuck with me. My, it will be from the, from the day I die. It's just, it lets you go out there and, and what do I really want to say, but I can do it however I want, whether it be, you know, aliens in outer space or like a shortcut where you're talking about somebody who invents a device that gives you instant enlightenment. You know, you can just kind of go where, where, where those thoughts take you. Cool. I got to tell you, I'm working on my second book too. It's, you know, it's nonfiction, you know, the parents surviving and thriving. Uh, but after watching my kid read your book, I, I, I'm going to try to dabble in that. So get some advice from you writing a kid's yeah. book. Worst thing about being a writer. It's definitely the long feedback cycle. You know, you, you go through three or four revisions and each revision you're talking about a year or more of a process with a fiction book. You know, we're talking about 60, you know, 50 to 60,000 words to, or more, you know, you get, you give it somebody to read, you get me back, you know, three weeks, a month later. Um, so it's a lot harder to iterate and to, and to get that feedback and work it into your books. So it can tend to be kind of more isolated because of, of that cycle. Did you ever get, though, one person said they absolutely love it, it's awesome, and the other person said change A, B, and C? Like, the, okay. then what do you do? Well, you know, I used to have from the board games, too, where you have to do that on a regular cycle. There, there are games where you know, 25, 30 revisions later, and you think you've got it down pat and you deal with all the feedback. Oh, I hated it. You said you loved it, you know, 10 versions ago. Um, <laughs> so you get kind of used to that. So with the writing, it's, it's very much about, all right, well, you know, what taking that feedback to filtering it, you know, that they're, they're coming at it from a very different perspective. Maybe it just doesn't resonate with them. You know, maybe they hate hockey with an undying passion. They're not going to like the rainy river bees because they got yeah. a lot of hockey. In it. Yeah. Uh, but there may be a kernel. There's usually a kernel of truth to it. You've got to get down to that. You know, we just watched Jumanji, the new version. Uh, we love the old one, but did you see Jumanji? Or you don't watch movies? I love the old one. They made a new one. <laughs> well, they made a new one. It's I just uh, uh, you know, red box right now. But the kid gets the old Jumanji game and throws it on the counter, and he never does it. Then the next day, the box is whatever is going crazy, and they sticks. It's it becomes a video game, uh, and the kid took it. So the question is. Do you ever, you know, do you think board games will ever go away and, and be replaced by video games? No, I mean, I think actually you see a lot of board games being ported over to that realm. You know, there's lots of apps that are ports of very popular board games. I think board games themselves, are, it's, just, it's really an art form. I, I got to work with a lot of awesome people and a lot of companies that really treat it as such. And it's one that's maturing. You know, I think the, the vernacular and, and the acceptance of these games is these complex systems, whether it be a fun party game for your kids, but there's still a lot of, design and, and thought process and um, philosophy even goes into some of these games. We like the adult games. You're playing with cards, you know, whether 
you know, games you play when the kids aren't around. We're enjoying those games as we get older. Yeah, the hobby keeps growing. It's it's awesome. Chris, you, you talked about your love of hockey. I, I am not a hockey guy. All those listening, I apologize. I know that's uh, blasphemy, but you know what? What is holding hockey back from from being one of the major sports? Right? If you if you put basketball, baseball, football, like you know, where, why isn't hockey on the pedestal with them? I, I'd say that it's on that pedestal, but I may be a little partial. Um, you, you know, one of the things you do see is a lot of the major sports participation is dropping, but hockey is seeing rapid growth. I mean, as I know, USA Hockey uh, registrations are up six straight years. Um, Percentage-wise, you know, it, it's, it's getting better. But, you know, it's definitely held back by it's, it's much more expensive. You know, it's it's hard to be exposed to something when it, you, have to, you have to get a team together. You've got to find ice time. You know, street hockey is one thing, but, you know, getting the equipment, the sticks, the net, the puck, um, other players, I'm going to get all the goalie equipment. It can be, it can be a, it's harder to get your reps in. You know, if you want to get better at basketball, you go get your rabbit ball, you go to a hoop and you can stay there. You know, if there's lights, you can stay up there all night, just shooting hoops, getting better. But, you know, sometimes it's really hard to, to take a lot of slap shots or, you know, or you grow, your neighbors get a little annoyed by the garage door being slammed 800 times at three in the morning, right? <laughs> So it can be yeah. a little bit tougher to get those reps in, but I know the like, NHL and equipment manufacturers are doing an amazing job of giving kids that chance and, and exposing them to the sport. And actually, it's one of the things I like doing with the book is, you know, you may get this this sci- kid that loves sci-fi and get him exposed to hockey and vice versa. So that's, We're going to have going to get happen. the NHL to uh, buy in here and they might have a uh, rainy river bees night, you know, give the book away at the, at the uh, to the kids there. I'm well, working on it. <laughs> yeah. Well, Chris, we're going to wrap up here, and uh, we like to end with a quote, and I know today's quote really uh, resonated uh, with you. Um, if you would like to to read it, uh, if you have it there, I don't know if you yeah, – did yeah, you yeah. have it in front of you? Uh-huh. Yeah, we'll let you read today's quote. So books are the quietest and most constant of friends. They are the most accessible and wisest of counselors and the most patient of teachers. It's by Charles W. Ilio. And I know that resonated with you. You wanted to touch on that? Yeah, for me, you know, one, of, one of my favorite things to do if I'm at a party or I might go to somebody's apartment, I don't really know them that well. Even if I do, I, I love going to their bookshelf. The first place I look for the bookshelf or wherever they got their books stored, and you've got to find out who are their counselors, who are, the, who are their patient teachers. You know, if you take the quote literally and, and you know, whether it be an office, you know, if I'm at a client's office, they have a few books on the shelf, kind of who's inspiring them or, or what, what are they thinking about? What are they trying to learn? Uh, where do we have common ground? And this is one of those tricks that any, next time you're at a party and anyone listening, just go try it and just see see what you can find out about a person just from the, from what's inspired them. So Great tip, uh, Chris. And everyone, this is Chris Croyder, and you can check him out, chriscroyder.com. Uh, his book, The Shortcut, is, is just coming out now. Uh, I'm looking forward to reading that. And, uh, again, we talked a lot about the uh, Rainy River Bees. Chris, I wish you the best uh, with your daughter coming, and uh, uh, it's an exciting time for you. Uh, thanks so much. I'm excited. Yeah. Enjoyed having you on, Chris, and uh, looking forward to getting the blog out. It's always tricky writing a blog when you have an author as your guest because I know <laughs> I know you'll be reading with a keen eye. I won't edit too hard. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. Thanks for having me on. Chris, it's an honor. Yeah. Great to talk with you. And uh, again, wish you the best. Uh, check out his books, uh, Moms and Dads, and, and, and all of those listening. Uh, go out and change the world for the better, everyone. It's the end of July. You got halfway of the summer left. Uh, go out and enjoy that time. And thanks for tuning in. Education, Leadership, and Beyond signing off. Thanks, Chris. Take care. All right, man.